Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get going. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome along to our CIRA Early Years Network May event. I'll just share a little bit about the network for those of you who are joining us for the first time. The CIRA Early Years Network is a forum for promoting professional development alongside best practice for the early learning and childcare profession in Scotland. We focus on the interdisciplinary aims of education, health and social care for the early education and childhood studies profession, as well as concerns of social justice and tackling poverty by encouraging innovation within early years of research. We aim to sustain and forge new links with policymakers, practitioners and the public. The members of this network are committed to expanding research informed practice by building international partnerships. Network members have established partnerships in Spain, Norway, Sweden, Iceland and Italy. Members are currently involved in working with the SSSC, the Scottish Government, Earlier Scotland and third sector organisations. We recognise the need to involve current students as well as graduates working within the early education field to learn more about the impact of sector developments on, uh, on children's outcomes, as well as promoting and critiquing research outcomes. I hope you can all hear me. Um, I can just see someone that's got no sound in the chat. Can you, can you all hear me? Okay, brilliant. I suspect that's an individual issue rather than uh, a me issue. So our main event today is looking at exploring language and emotions. This is a really exciting event and we've got three fantastic speakers that are going to look at ways to support practice in terms of children's language and emotional developments. The way in which it's going to work, uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Katrina, and then we're going to have a short 10 minute segment for questions before Katrina has to sneak off. And then in the second part, I'm going to I'm trying to speak a little bit louder. Sorry if my, my sound's quiet. Once Katrina's presentation is finished and I've responded to questions, it will then be Joanna and Tanya. Then we'll have a panel at the end with both of those speakers. So let me go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Katrina Gill from the University of Edinburgh, who is currently an associate tutor on the Froebel Early Childhood Practice course at the University of Edinburgh. She is a committee member of the Edinburgh Froebel Network and a trustee of the Froebel Trust. Until 2021, Katrina was head teacher of Green Gables Nursery School and Family Centre in Edinburgh, where the pedagogy was based on Fabellian principles. She regularly presents her work at conferences and seminars and contributed a chapter to the book, Putting Storytelling at the Heart of Early Childhood Practice. Before becoming a teacher, Katrina was a theatre director and person-centred counsellor, and this informs her belief in the transformative power of child-centred creativity and play. Katrina is currently an early, an early education, an early years education officer with Education Scotland. Katrina, it's, it's brilliant to welcome you along today. Um, I'll let you go ahead and share your slides. We'll get going with the presentation. Thank you, Shadai. That's lovely. It's so funny listening to um, somebody talking about you and, and saying what, <laughs> what, what you do and where you come from. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to try and whisk through this because I have got loads to say, and people that know me know that I am very chatty. So um, let's start. Oh, and let me figure out where I am clicking. I'm clicking here. There we go. Okay. So this research that I'm going to talk to you today um, about was part of what was called the Players and Storytellers Practitioner Research Project, which was published as this book here, Putting Storytelling at the Heart of Early Childhood Practice in 2020. Um, and it emerged from a community of practice that had um, developed as a result of a number of practitioners who'd undertaken the Fogel and Childhood Practice course at the University of Edinburgh coming together and, and this group had a shared interest in a principled approach to early years and they are also really interested in continuous professional development and there were around 15 of us in the group and we worked over a period of several years and we chose to focus on literacy and how it links to play and to storytelling so in particular, the work I'm going to be talking about today is my study of the use of story grammars to support the development of coherence in written narrative within the context of a Fravelian play-based primary one classroom. So there are, there are a few explicit references to the development of literacy in accessible readings written by Froebel, and that's because I, um, I, partly because there's lots of writing um, of Froebel's that hasn't been translated into English. 
So what we have is, is relatively limited, but he did describe the child as a natural storyteller. And he also um, described in some detail how a child might learn to read and to write in his pedagogics of kindergarten. However, I think it really is possible to kind of extrapolate from Froebel's principles, um, an approach that's based on play, uh, on holistic experiences, and on an innate urge to self-activity, which really includes the need to make the inner outer and the outer inner. And I'll talk a wee bit more about that um, as we go on. So as a starting point, the group focused on work by Nicolopoulou um, around play and storytelling. And she has a focus on the development of inactive and discursive narrative and how these come together. And again, I'll, I'll return to those and, and go into a bit more detail. So a, a central principle of a Frobelian education is this concept of making the inner outer and the outer inner, whereby a child's life experiences are internalized and then reflected upon, and then they're expressed through um, symbolic systems such as play, drawing, writing, modeling, etc. And Froebel really felt that writing was an impulse that a child developed in response to a really rich inner life. And that inner life was developed through the opportunity for experiences, rich real life experiences, and thoughtful reflection. And as the child accumulates experience and they start to become aware of that, um, they urgently feel this need to preserve their ideas in, in a tangible form, and, and this is how writing becomes developed. So when we're considering how we can help and support children to become better writers, it's really essential that we continue to remind ourselves of this multimodal nature of human language and storytelling. And as we move into the more formal stages of schooling, it's really important that we don't narrow the curriculum into a kind of compartmentalized mechanistic approach. And that's quite you know, common. Um, we see that happening in, in lots of places. And, and Froebel says here, you know, nothing should ever be brought to the notice of the human being in um, a purely arbitrary connection that does not admit um, at least the possibility of discovering a necessary inner reason. And actually, as education becomes more and more data driven and there's a significant focused attention on closing the socioeconomic attainment gap, we run the risk of forgetting the importance of holistic approaches to developing language and storytelling. You know, it's, it's all too easy to focus on things that can be measured, that can be packaged. And as professionals, it's really important to locate our practice in research but we also have to be cautious. You know, approaches and policy interventions that are based on findings from narrowly focused research studies can actually create situations in classrooms where the approaches become an end in themselves. And we lose sight of the importance of these rich language experiences. You know, one of those that really comes to mind is, is the Hart and Risley study, which you'll often hear quoted. And this was one of the first to link vocabulary size to socioeconomic status. But actually, I think it has kind of resulted in a bit of a deficit perspective of language, which also reflects some biases and stereotypes which were kind of embedded in that research. But actually, it's led to some quite narrowly focused programs which kind of boost vocabulary. Um, and, and I think we have to be really cautious and interrogate the, these kinds of, of things to make sure that you know, we, we have confidence in that research that we are um, basing our practice within. So at the time of this study in my own classroom, um, I so I had um, a primary one class and I had had those children for two years previously in nursery and had gone with them into primary one. Um, and I was expected at the time to use an approach to writing which focused on vocabulary, on connectives, openers, punctuation. Some of you might recognize um, that approach. I'm not going to name it. Um, writing was to be improved by leveling up sentences, you know, essentially adding more or better vocabulary or connectives. I've never heard of a writer that levels up their writing like that, but never mind. Um, the assessment we had to do was based on children writing a letter which you know, perhaps is not the most appropriate genre for a five-year-old who lives in a time when messages are mostly sent you know, via email or text. And you know, how many five-year-olds have actually seen a letter being written or received a letter? You know, so it's very important we consider that um, and the kinds of experiences that children have. 
And actually this approach to teaching writing really focused on that, those technical aspects of writing that were separate from any kind of understanding of what it means to be a writer. And, and Froebel really talks about the paucity of such approaches. You know, if there's no context, no connection to the inner thought processes, you know, no drive or impulse or spark, then children are not interested or not motivated to act. So children really need rich experiences provided by a developmentally appropriate early years curriculum, which emphasizes play, language, and investigation and in a context that's really important of adult support and guidance um, and for that urge to communicate um, in ways that will preserve a child's ideas to develop and they need to understand I think from within what it is to be a writer what what does it mean to be a writer So Froebel said that play was the highest phase of child development. It's highly serious and of deep significance. And the plays of childhood are the germinal leaves of all later life. And play is a key aspect of Froebelian practice. It's recognized as a central integrating element in a child's development and learning. And its purpose, Froebel says, is to guide children back upon their own nature and to lead them onwards to observe the life of the outer world. So in a sense, it play is a metacognitive tool that helps children reflect on, on their understanding. And actually, this is the essence of Froebel's understanding of the aim of education, coming to know yourself as a human being. Um, and this idea of play as guiding children to understand the self and to grow towards understanding the world they're part to is really central to our humanity. And I would say in the same way as is storytelling. Telling stories is what we do as human beings. Um, and, and actually, um, Gray writes that in play from their own desires, children practice the art of being human. Um, and, and I think that's really, really important. If we think about, um, you know, a more modern um, theorist such as Vygotsky, he proposed that play, specifically sociodramatic or role play, is the leading developmental activity of the child between the ages of three and six. And rather than it being a free and spontaneous activity without rules or social pressure, it's a way of exploring the world of social roles and relationships where the motive is to act like an adult. So that is, you know, an interesting concept of play. And this idea of sociodramatic play where children negotiate a play scenario, they take on roles and develop a joint narrative. It appears to have a key function in development and it's really characterized by symbolic representation and symbolic actions and for Froebel symbolic representation is this concept of inner and outer and outer and inner and he really viewed that as a, an in, in, you know, immense purpose of, of being and becoming a, a human being um, and there certainly seems to be a link uh, support for the link between sociodramatic play and this development of symbolic representation. So in 1980, Diachenko taught children how to use representable objects, substitutes such as sticks and paper cutouts. And, uh, you know, I'd be really interested to see how that links maybe with um, Tanya's um, presentation around use of puppets. Um, so this use of the representational object substitutes to support the retelling of a story. And Dechenko found that then children could subsequently use their own substitutes to retell a new story, indicating that they developed this ability to create a sort of internal symbolic story model. And in a similar way, I think it's quite likely that the use of symbolic objects during sociodramatic play also leads to that development of symbolic thought. There's also a growing body of evidence which suggests that play in the early years, specifically creative sociodramatic play, sensitively supported by early years practitioners, has an important impact on the development of executive functions, on higher order thinking, and of course on creativity as well. Um, and, you know, I think there's this lovely quote from um, Bruner, which says, play provides a courage all its own. It provides not only a medium for exploration, but also for invention. And, and I just love that quote. So when we think about um, play and storytelling and narrative, Vivian Gusson Paley talks about play as story in action, just as storytelling is play put into narrative form. And Nicola Poulou sees young children's storytelling and sociodramatic play as complementary modes of their narrative activity on a continuum ranging from the discursive exhibition 
exposition of narratives in storytelling to their enactment in pretend play. So that, that these two things, discursive narrative, that spoken narrative, um, and then enactive nar narrative playing, acting out. So these narrative modes, discursive and inactive, initially emerge separately and distinctly. So children tend to act out proto-narratives within their play, even before they've kind of got a command of spoken language, they, they will start to do that. And in their play, they'll focus first on character development and sets of actions with mu without much attention to narrative structure. But as narrative, as language develops and as they listen to the stories told around them, they start to tell their own stories. And in doing so, they start to develop those early narrative structures and they start to emerge. So although the, those two different narrative modes are initially distinct and complementary, Nicola Pullo suggests, um, and this is a quote from her, that pretend play and narrative should not be artificially separated and studied in mutual isolation. Instead, they should be viewed as closely related and often intertwined forms of socially situated symbolic action. And this is really important for when children have frequent opportunities to hear stories and tell stories and play out stories, these separate narrative modes start to converge and integrate and they create a really powerful matrix for learning and development. So there is also a growing body of research that shows that the mastery of narrative skills by children in their preschool and early years provides an important foundation for long-term literacy success, that between the ages of three and six, narrative um, skills are a strong predictor of literacy skills at age eight to 10, um, that children can learn skills that enable them to sustain and develop their socio-dramatic play. And there are specific things that adults can do to support them. And the work of Smolansky is really interesting around this. Um, also, of course, Vivian Gus and Paley's story acting approach, which really works really well and um, to bring together these two types of narrative modes. And you may be more familiar with the helicopter stories approach, which is essentially Vivian Gus and Paley's um, story acting. Um, and so it seems really essential um, that in our early years classrooms, we offer an environment and a pedagogical approach which supports the development and convergence of both an active and discursive narrative and enables children to achieve effective narrative integration and, and really that cross fertilization between pretend play and storytelling. So we can see there's this really important role for the adult in the classroom um, in providing a very particular environment and a play-based pedagogy in developing children's narrative competence. Um, and I think it's important to say that pedagogy that's based on play doesn't um, mean um, one where children are just left to get on with it on their own. It's really crucial that educators observe, support and extend, and you know, that's the words of Tina Bruce there, observe, support and extend, and they have an active participatory role in their classrooms. And that was a really key aspect of Frobelian practice, that it's not a laissez-faire approach, it's not an approach where um, the practitioners are just standing back and not being involved. Freedom with guidance um, is, is a really important Frobelian concept. And if you want to find out more, uh, Liebschner's work kind of explores that. And Frobel really stressed that important role of adults in supporting and guiding children. And I think this is really, really important because as children move from those sensory experiences of the world, um, you know, towards expressing themselves symbolically, we can support them by um, giving them experiences, by adding in knowledge, by giving words to things um, and helping them to, to create that um, understanding as they move from play into the more sort of formal aspects of, of drawing and writing. Oh. My slide's doing something funny now. Um, okay, so not quite sure why it's doing this. Let me just see if I can bring all those up. Let's go back, there we go. Okay, so, so as I said, I'd spent two and a half years with most of the children, um, having taught them since beginning nursery at three years old. Um, I'm, I had a few other children who joined the class in August at the beginning of primary one. Um, so this um, research took place um, between 
the um, end of February and June uh, 2015, which seems extraordinary that it's such a, a long time ago. Um, but this happened within my P1 class. I had 21 children um, and I um, had 40% of the children had English as an additional language, mainly Polish speakers. 25% uh, of the children had additional support needs, including one with complex needs. Um, I looked at four pieces of writing of different genres and different structures, and I used the first and the fourth writing samples because they were narrative pieces of writing and they were analysed for cohesion and narrative structure. Um, and in the end, the inquiry sample was 11 children because those were the ones who had completed all four pieces of writing. And the sample included several children with the EAL, one with an um, autism spectrum disorder and one with a strong history of dyslexia. My practice is based on Frobelian principles, which is, will come as no surprise. Um, and my pedagogy reflects a Frobelian approach um, with a significant focus on supporting high quality, creative free flow play. And this was not support, uh, straightforward in a P1 classroom um, that was not well resourced for play. And um, we're having a great movement at the moment for play in primary one and realizing the ambition has, has really supported that. But, you know, seven years ago, that was not happening very consistently at all. Um, it was just me in the classroom, apart from my child with complex needs who did have a one to one support. And I had an expectation that I was delivering a very structured and mechanistic writing program that I was delivering synthetic phonics programs. However, around those um, asks, I was providing as well as I could a rich and imaginative curriculum with lots of hands-on experiences, lots of opportunities for creative play, whilst also meeting expectations of senior management. And, and sometimes you just have to close the door and uh, get on with it. Um, so the curriculum I was providing was literacy rich and it had a sustained focus on traditional tales and interactive storytelling. It was a multi-sensory approach, which enabled the children to explore stories through puppets, through small world, drama, block play, construction, drawing, painting, modeling, all of these things. Traditional tales were particularly chosen because of the repetitive nature of the texts and those clear narrative structures. And we looked at one traditional tale per term at depth so that the children had the opportunity to develop characters within their play and embed the story structure through exploring that text in a real sort of wide variety of different ways through story times and also in their symbolic play. And I think this really benefited the children with EAL because they had multiple opportunities to hear and internalize and reproduce the repeti repetitive aspects of the text. And they also had the opportunity to use those representative representational objects to create a symbolic story model. And you know, we would often hear the the Polish children, um, you know, repeating the uh, you know, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down because that was a repetitive thing. And, and certainly in the nursery, sometimes those traditional tales were the first English language we were hearing from some of our um, English learners. Um, I saw so in primary one, I was continuing this traditional tales literacy focus that I had started in, in nursery. Um, so just before the period of research, we'd been exploring the three little pigs, and then we focused on Jack and the Beanstalk, um, and really sort of helping the children to um, repeat that structure and internalize it. And then this moved into an exploration of giants and castles, and, and the children really took the learning off in their own directions. Um, I'm going to briefly mention two approaches, and I could talk for a long time about these, but I really don't have time to. Oh, and it's all coming up in funny ways. So they, I drew on two approaches. One was Foundations of Writing, and the other was Pi Corbett's Story Making, which is now called Talk for Writing. And this really helped develop children's storytelling and writing. So in Foundations of Writing, writing becomes a group activity connected to symbolic action and focusing on composition skills. And so it's drawing on that Vygotskian concept of the social nature of learning. And it really has two functions. It helps develop motor skills before children are taught the technical aspects of writing. And it also encourages children to tell stories in their drawings, which can then be scribed by an adult. And, and drawing resembles writing in lots and lots of different ways. You know, the drawer first has to think about the subject and then select what they're going to draw. You can modify a drawing and improve it and, you know, make it clearer by adding detail. 
and also by kind of giving children um, experiences to draw. So, you know, actually helping them reach up to switch off a light or catch a ball, you can help make that link um, to their own experience in, in their drawing. So using drama, using mime, children can be supported to connect how their body feels or how certain actions are carried out. And actually through offering these kinds of experiences, children's drawings, and subsequently their writing improves significantly. And, and when I show you some samples of writing, which I'm gonna to have to do very quickly, um, you'll see, for instance, several of the children have called the giant in their story Stompy. And that's because we did work around how would a giant move? And a lot of them thought that they would stomp around. So this name became linked. Um, the story making approach aims to give children a bank of oral stories and narrative structures that they can draw on to inform their own stories. So children will use a pictorial or symbolic story map, which is developed by the group, and they'll use actions to support the storytelling, particularly for connectives, and also using puppets, role play, acting out, help bring that story to life. And so really this multi-sensory approach to understanding and sequencing narrative can really help children sort of internalise those narrative patterns. And this has been a, shown to be quite a powerful strategy for improving boys' writing in particular, and also for children with English as an additional language. So the other thing that I also used was story grammars. So in order to construct a coherent story, children have to draw on their knowledge of narrative in order to develop the actions of their characters and to structure a sequence of events in a way that makes sense both temporarily and causally. And Shapiro and Hudson suggest that this may be accomplished by accessing schematic information that defines a set of rules governing the organization of categories and contexts of a story as defined by story grammar. Um, so story grammars were first proposed in sort of 1975 by Rummelhart as a way of differentiating between the strings of sentences which form stories from strings of sentences which don't. And they provide an outline of the sort of internal structure of the story. And Stein and Glenn's work in 1979 found that children recall stories in a highly organized way. And they identified seven sort of schemas or grammars in a simple story. Um, and they found that major settings, direct consequences and initiating events were the most um, frequently recalled. So therefore it made sense for me to focus on these key components with my early writers. So we looked at orientation, we looked at problem and we looked at resolution. And one of the strengths of using story grammar is it supports children's understanding by explaining clearly the function of each grammar ele element. And for me, this is this the freedom with guidance. So there was lots of opportunity for children to explore through their play, but there was also this adult element of guidance. So using those words, orientation, and explaining this means characters and setting, problem, or the dramatic event, something has to happen, and the resolution or solving that problem, rather than the much, much vaguer and the one that absolutely just gets my goat, which is beginning, middle and end. What does that mean to a child? It's so often used with young writers, but it has no real meaning. So we need to really help children and give them clear messages about how they can structure a, 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 a plot. Um, and there's lots of you know, research that really kind of helps, um, you know, shows that, that story grammars can be really useful um, and in increasing coherence within children's writing. So I, when I looked at the writing samples and I analyzed sample one and sample four, so sample one was written at the end of a study of the Three Little Pigs, and this had been a, a less immersive and less focused approach. Um, and it was kind of before the work on foundations of writing and the focus on story grammar. Um, and that was the first sample. And I was looking at which elements of story grammar were there. So what ones could I identify? And it was clear from this that the writing was very simple and had very little structure. And only three pieces of writing out of 11 contained all three story grammar elements. So I'm just going to quickly whiz you through um, a few examples. So this one was just the orientation this one ha was just the resolution this one had some orientation and then some kind of resolution although they weren't particularly linked um, this one um, had orientation 
it did have problem and it did have a resolution. But when I looked at those 11 pieces, um, six of them only had one narrative element. Two of, um, no, okay, two of them had two narrative elements and three of them, only three of them had the, the three narrative elements within. So you can see that actually um, that was quite a, a, a limited number of, of more complex stories. When we looked at sample four, so this was written at the end of the focused work, which had been based on Jack and the Beanstalk. Children had developed their own characters through drama, through role play, um, through modeling, um, and through character studies. And we'd used explicitly those story grammar elements to analyze the stories we were reading in class and to help structure our group story writing. And there was a significant improvement in narrative coherence. So the majority of children were able to include all three elements in their writing and the writing, all the writing had become more complex and detailed. So this was the first child who had just used orientation and they actually managed to use the three. Um, again, this was the second child, um, and they again managed to use the three aspects, and they had only used a kind of resolution in their last piece, in their first piece, sorry. Um, this child was one who had used all three aspects, but this was much more complex piece of writing and more connected and, and, and more linked. And again, this, this one, you can see, this one's called Stompy. Um, and you can see that um, when he stomped, his feet got louder and louder. So that linking with that experience that they'd had through the acting it out. And again, that, that real um, orientation problem resolution being seen there. Um, so when we looked at this in the 11 pieces that I had analyzed, um, there were nine of them that had all three elements and only two of them that had two elements. So a really significant um, change. So it's really important that we don't um, separate, um, you know, those uh, artificially, but really study play and narrative in, in, you know, as closely intertwined. And although, you know, this was a really small scale practitioner inquiry um, and limited conclusions can be drawn for it, I think it's clear that providing that rich, creative, multi-sensory environment and a pedagogy which supports symbolic play enables both an active and discursive narrative modes to develop and begin to intertwine. And that adult guidance through the use of story grammars can bring those narrative modes further together and has a positive impact on the development of narrative structure and coherence in children's writing. And just really finally, um, a quote there from Frobo. So writing and reading lift man beyond every other known creature and bring him nearer the realization of his destiny. Through the practice of these arts, he attains personality. The possession of the alphabet places the possibility of self-consciousness within his reach for it alone renders true self-knowledge possible. So that is me. I've probably gone well over my time, so I apologize. I will send, I don't know if you distribute, I will send um, a PDF of the presentation. My uh, references are slightly out of date, so I will update them before I send it. Um, but that, you'll be glad to know is me finished. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, Shadai. Thank you so much, Katrina. That was a, a really rich presentation. Um, and it's so clear that storytelling is so generative in terms of the, the various learning opportunities that are provided. We've got a few minutes now for questions, so I'll just let them come through on the chat. Uh, I'll ask one of my own whilst, whilst they're coming through, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, and it, was, I think it was really nice to hear about your projects. I'm becoming Frobelian myself, I think. I'm becoming more immersed in that world. I guess I'm interested in, in what you've done with the project since and where you've taken the learnings and, and how that's been applied in, in perhaps other contexts and what that, that's looked like in the, in the more recent years since, perhaps. I mean, I think, you know, the, the work was presented at um, a big conference and then we ran a full day at the Storytelling Centre where because there are, I think, about 13 chapters in, in the book. Um, so mm -hmm. we went through all of the chapters in each of the writers and presented on the work. And then obviously in 2020, the book was, was published. Um, and so I think, you know, we've, we've disseminated in, in different ways. Um, one of the um, things we took part in during that first lockdown, a number of us were involved in a practitioner, um, 
I guess a book group really, um, and it was Scottish Educators Connect, which was an online group, and we read the, the book together and some of the people who had written the chapter spoke a bit more about their work. So I think really, um, I mean, I, I you know, very much took that forward in, in my role in, in, in my work at, at Green Gables, where I was head teacher. Um, in my current role, I mean, I still teach on the Froglin Childhood Practice course, but I now work for Education Scotland as an, an education um, officer. In that role, I um, am not promoting specifically for Bemian practice. Um, education Scotland looks at high quality practice across um, all different um, approaches. Um, and, but um, I think that the work that we did during the storytelling project is, is really high quality practice. Um, and and it's, I think, important that that, that gets you know, disseminated further. So um, I would very much recommend that the book to people. Um, it's there. It won an award at the um, Nursery World Awards for professional books. So um, I think people are finding it really helpful. Um, and, it, and it goes from very young children right through into um, the primary one setting. Mm. Yeah, it's really good to hear that the message is getting out there. And I think in spite of COVID over the past two years, the fact that you've been able to come together and you know, have that book group and have that generative discussion mm -hmm. is really, really important. Thank you. So we've got a question from Sue. Um, did you use scribing for those children who are still finding it difficult to write for themselves? So, yeah, absolutely. Um, although the examples there um, were written examples by the children, um, but, which is why I wrote them out at the side, because sometimes it was a wee bit difficult to decipher. decipher. This was, um, you know, kind of later on in the year. So, um, you know, the, the children, most of the children were, were quite able children. And there were a number who did need support. And I think it's really about supporting the children where they are meeting the child's needs. So for those children who um, struggled with um, writing, then yeah, absolutely. And I think scribing is a very valid way. Um, and actually one of the really powerful aspects of story acting is children having their stories scribed by a practitioner and they can see that written and that can be extended as children start to be able to write their own words. They may write some of the words in the scribing. Um, so it may be a combination of practitioner and the child's writing in that story and I have to say I much prefer that approach to things where children are tracing over written words I've certainly seen you know people writing the child will speak the sentence and the practitioner will write it in yellow pencil and then the child will draw over it in a black pen and I just don't see the purpose of that um, you know I, I think it's also important to think about handwriting as separate from writing Writing is about telling a story. It's about um, constructing a narrative. And, and for young children who are just developing that handwriting part, um, scribing can be really powerful to help um, take the pressure off getting the writing right and breaking up the thought process of structuring the narrative. Um, so I would certainly say, and I see Ali and Wendy saying there, scribing is good modeling for children, absolutely. And, and, and I think that's so important. Children need to see that writing has a purpose, you know, and that's why they need these rich experiences. You know, what's the point of writing if it, you know, so we have showing children writing shopping lists, um, you know, going, going um, you know, to, to write up the weather or whatever, um, you know, it, it really helps have that um, real life experience um, to, to help children have a, a context for what writing is about. Yeah, thank you, Katrina. That's, that, that all feels really, really important. Um, Brilliant. I'm looking at the chat. I can't see any more questions, or I can see one just as I, I speak that sentence. Uh, so from Ali Wendy Dunlop. What do you think motivates children to move from telling the narrative to wanting to record it? Is it because we ask, or does it come from then? Oh, that's a complex <laughs> question, Ali <laughs> Wendy. Um, do you know, it's cultural, I think. Children see writing around them. They see stories in books. If they're in a rich, a literacy rich environment, they see it. And if it's been modeled as something important, then I think it's they see that as something they want to, to take part in. Um, now, you know, if you're in a culture where the written word is not part of your culture, then you probably don't see young children um, expressing their stories in, in writing. You'll probably much more see that in their um, symbolic representation in, in other ways. But I think we we have a, a, a innate need to represent symbolically. 
um, and because we have developed these written languages um, then you know it's it's something that children see around them I think it's also something that we have to be really um, cognizant of that a lot of our children will come from families where there's maybe not much reading at home or much writing or families where literacy is, is challenging. They'll come from families where all of the writing and reading is in a different language from the one that they're seeing in nursery. And that might also include a completely different script and also written in a completely different direction. So children are making sense of all, all of that in, in lots and lots of different ways. And I think, um, so, so I think it's a combination. I think it's a cultural a cultural thing um, and but you know we know it's an important thing about being a human being being able to communicate being able to tell your story of who you are um, and what you care about and what you feel um, and experience in life is really really important yeah tough question but really good answer there Katrina um, we're out of time now so I'm gonna ask everyone to say thank you for, for joining us it was a brilliant presentation lots and lots of thoughts that I'm kind of left with about the value of storytelling. I think there'll be some good links with our, with our forthcoming presentations. So thank you very much for that, Katrina. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm always delighted to speak about this. <laughs> so now we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Dr. Joanna Winchenchek at the University of Glasgow. Joanna is, if I can just find my notes one second, a lecturer at the School of Education at the University of Glasgow. She is an experimental psychologist and her research focuses broadly on emotion, cognition and neurobiological basics of social perception and social judgments. Her current research projects include developing interventions for increasing social and emotional competence in children or measuring the impact on community-based activity on emotional well-being. Joanna, it's lovely to welcome you along today. The, uh, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much for the invitation. Lovely to be here. Um, I, I am under slight pressure, pressure because um, I am not a practitioner. I'm a researcher. Um, I very much research you know, brain mechanisms that underpin emotion understanding. Um, and I'm trying to find application for it to, you know, it's sort of in, in minimal, meaningful areas. Um, so I will present today a project which um, has sort of um, started a um, couple of years ago, it's a collaboration um, with Puppet Animation Scotland um, and it's looking at Puppet and Emotional Resilience um, program that is aiming at developing emotional resilience and promoting emotional competence in young children and um, using puppetry. And um, it's very much um, work still in progress. So I will uh, try to outline um, um, the program aims, what we're hoping to achieve, what we're currently doing. Um, and I'm very, uh, very curious to hear your thoughts, um, hear your comments and any feedback on how uh, we can make it most useful to, um, to early years and, and sort of early, um, early curriculum as well. So a little bit about the program. Um, the program uh, is a partnership that's really developed by uh, Puppet Animation uh, Scotland, um, which is uh, based in Edinburgh. And um, their mission really is to tell stories using uh, images other than text. Uh, they use puppetry, visual theatre, and animated films to engage um, children and, and other audiences. Um, and uh, one of um, the lead Scottish puppeteers, uh, Amy Finley, is working with them and developed um, the program, really the core of the program uh, I'll present to you today. Um, and Amy is also a CEO of My Kind of Book, um, which creates books for children uh, with additional support needs, um, also with children with um, multiple disabilities. And, and they really, the goal of, the, of My Kind of Book is to provide books and sensory studies for children, for any child to enjoy. Um, and uh, our second lead puppeteer in the project, uh, Beth Hamilton Cartus, is a writer, performer, community worker and storyteller and, and, and brings her expertise into the project as well. I think Beth might be in the audience today. So Beth, if you're here, you know, do, do kind of give us a wave um, and uh, it'll be good to, um, uh, if you can come in and correct me at any point as well. Um, so um, the project has received funding, there's not funding from uh, Billy Guilford, um, 
and has subsequently received some funding from Experimental Psychological Society and, and more recently from the UKRI as well. So we have few evaluations ongoing and we're hoping to join and hoping to expand. Um, so your feedback here will be very useful as well. Okay. So what is the program? Well, the Puppetry and Emotional Resilience Program is, um, is a bespoke puppetry program um, designed from preschool children and T1. It worked best with this age group. We're finding that um, older children um, are a little bit harder to engage with puppetry. And it's designed to develop emotional literacy, resilience, and empathy, and really promote general well-being in children. Um, and we use it by uh, tackling complex and difficult emotional subjects in a very accessible way um, using puppetry. So the main aim of the program is really to increase the level of confidence, problem solving, um, and really ultimately that would result in better educational attainment and better school experience for children. Um, and it's based on um, evidence from uh, similar projects than elsewhere um, that uh, found uh, very profound evidence that puppetry and successful puppetry interventions and programs designed to promote um, the well-being and positive emotional competence um, really do work. And you know, there's evidence that they can reduce the stigma around mental health in young children. There's evidence that they can strengthen social and emotional competence. Um, and, uh, and and really, you know, it's one of the art based intervention that could be scalable and could be really successfully um, uh, implemented in various settings. Um, the program uh, have really begun in 2015, um, where it was piloted in a small scale in, in, in one primary school and nursery in Maslogra. Um, and it really gained quite a positive anecdotal um, evidence that you know it does work for children's communication and it helps children to gain confidence um and then um we, we thought there's sort of that there's more in it so i came on board around 2019 um where the puppet animation scotland has, uh, has asked us to conduct a larger scale evaluation to gather more evidence on the impact of the program on um on children's well-being and emotional well-being. Um, we started piloting the program in Isle of Butte that was interrupted by the pandemic. Um, then the program was uh, revamped to work in a more hybrid uh, format and has been enrolled in 2020 in the noon, a um, couple of settings over there. Um, and more recently, we launched um, a larger scale evaluation in uh, Delmarnock in Glasgow. And the plans are as, again to, to move to, to additional areas um, from the next academic and, and, and session. So I'll present some early evaluations, very, very early, because it's still very much ongoing from the, the noon cluster. Uh, but predominantly, I really want you to sort of engage into what we're hoping to achieve and how we're doing it. The program is uh, designed to in sort of three main stages. Um, first is the training stage, um, where teachers and practitioners receive a bespoke um, sessions with Aileen, with Beth, with their puppeteers, uh, um, where they introduced to uh, how to work with the puppets, um, to gain confidence in how to bring puppet to life, how to create this the fantasy using puppet. Um, and they also are um, presented with a bespoke uh, handmade puppet that it's only theirs and it's theirs for a lifetime. Um, additional one-to-one -one sessions are also available if teachers um, feel that they need a little bit more practice, a little bit more training, uh, but we're finding they generally respond very well and you know, each puppet has its own personality, his own backstory. Children create, co-create that that personality and this is the life story of the puppet and they co-create their future as well. Um, so, so it's really working well in practice. Then the delivery stage um, is uh, taking around six weeks, where after initial introduction of the puppet to the class, um, each week the school and the teacher will receive um, a puppet package. Um, and I'll show you more details of the puppet package next slide. Um, and each week they'll be dealing with different themes, there'll be different activities, um, uh, but it's designed to kind of work mostly so around six weeks, it's quite flexible depending on what's happening in the school at the time. It's quite flexible in terms of where in the term uh, the, the program is um, launched. Um, we then have a, at the end of the program, we have a follow-on activity, which is a check-in 
opportunity to, to, uh, to sit down with the teachers again, reflect on what worked well, and really try and plan any, any follow-on activities and, and how they can use the puppets in the future, how they can use it with their future classrooms or, or um, the re remaining time of the academic session. And then we also do um, uh, um, an evaluation of the program and we look at different levels, um, which I'll talk you through in a minute as well. So each week, um, teachers will receive a package with resources. Um, and these will be art resources, maybe crafts, maybe some books, there'll be story bo storytelling books, there'll be scripts for puppets and how to engage puppets in the classroom. Um, and each week, we're also focusing on different theme or different topic. Um, and these topics have been selected to, to really tackle on those challenging emotional um, uh, situations and, 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 and deal with it maybe situations that children might find challenging in the classroom or in, in sort of um, in, in, in general in their life. So there could be um, uh, issues around settling into new school nursery, especially if we're launching at the start of the uh, session. Um, there might be issues around emotional literacy, uh, talking about feelings, naming feelings, understanding feelings of, of others. Um, might be focusing on specific emotions, such as dealing with anger, how we control anger, how we um, remain calm, or anxiety how we can ma manage our anxieties and find coping strategies to do with anxieties. Um, there could also be um, more tailored to specific session, depending on the needs of the setting and depending on the needs of the teachers. There, there could be some adjustment and we can work, work with the teachers to, to provide the best, the best um, uh, sessions and the best packages. Um, and why, why it's important to focus more Kind of generally about emotion competence and emotion social understanding of, of others as we know that children's understanding of emotions of others and their social competence and related to school readiness and as i put it down i know it's a controversial term um and i'll be very uh, welcome to, to hear your comments on that as well um, but also about you know in terms of their interpersonal communication and then generally their positive experience and, and ability to build positive relationships with others which will have impact on their experience in school um so after uh, we um conduct the program um we uh, want to focus on the evaluation uh, we want to capture the impact that the program had on children and teachers, and we want to look at any potential uh, uh, positive uh, differences that it might have made to children's school experience. Um, so the evaluation really is a longitudinal uh, measure of changes, developmental changes in children's emotional understanding, their empathy, uh, their socio-emotional skills, but also changes in, in teachers and changes maybe in teachers' practice. So one of the um, measures we take is teacher report and we look at teachers sense of efficacy and teachers efficacy um, is their belief in their own ability to successfully complete specific tasks in the classroom and or deal with specific context um, and it's a really powerful contrast is that there's evidence showing that the efficacy is related to um, kids outcomes um, their achievements their motivation um, but it's also influences teachers' resilience and ability to, to sort of persist through difficult situations and deal with um, challenging events that are happening in the classroom. So we measure it through the short form of teacher sense of efficacy, uh, which really helps us to better understand the kinds of things that can create difficulties for teachers in their school activities. Um, we also measure um, children's um, emotions and behaviors through strengths and difficulties questionnaires, and then we interview teachers. So we get sort of a qualitative data, a sense of what works best, and a rich insight into you know, how, how the program really works in practice in their setting. Uh, we also engage parents. Um, we collect uh, the empathy measure from parents. Uh, Griffith Empathy Measure is a, is a quick questionnaire um, of 23 questions that parents um, complete on behalf of their children. And it's measuring children's empathetic behavior. Uh, it captures both their understanding of um, 
emotions of others, so what we call the, the cognitive dimensions of empathy, um, which is very complex. It really requires the cognitive ability to um, be able to take different perspectives, be able to mentalize, so understand that emotions of others are different from my own. Um, but it also uh, captures the second dimension of empathy, which is the affected empathy. Um, and that is more the ability to uh, share um, emotions of others or internalize emotions of others um, and understand so share their internal uh, mental states or emotional states and usually develops earlier in cognitive um, and we also uh, measure children's uh, face perception and the ability to understand emotions through uh, recognizing emotions in faces and i'll tell you in a minute why that we think that's important um, and finally we collect children's drawings as well we ask them to draw themselves in their classroom um, and children's drawings are as you know a, a, a powerful insights into their their own worlds and they can give us quite a good indicator of where they are how, how they're feeling in their environment so one of the main um focuses on the evaluation that is currently um undergoing is uh, measuring of children's ability to detect um, authenticity of emotion, to detect whether the emotion is genuine or pretend, whether the person is really one, you know, really showing a true emotion, or whether they're faking and pretending it. And that capacity is particularly important because it allows us to understand the the cause of emotion, why someone is showing specific emotions in others. Um, so kind of go to the bottom of their internal states. Um, you know, some might think it's controversial, but also allows us to identify who might be the reliable individuals, who we might be able to, or you, we might be um, building more trusting relationships with if they pretend, you know, that they might be having um, some ulterior methods uh, to, to you know, motives to show these emotions. Um, it also helps us to create this positive and trusting relationship with others. And that capacity is also close related to the ability to understand um, that internal and external emotions might differ. And it's a really powerful um, skill. It's linked to children's ability to understand that there's uh, multi-layers um, in, in hours of existence, that there, you know, what we might be feeling might be different from others are feeling, and what we might be showing might be different if we're actually uh, internally feeling. So sometimes, you know, that's linked to development of pretend play, that's what I was talking about, um, links to development of their uh, identity as well, and typically sort of begins to develop around six, four and six. Um, and that is also why we're targeting those age groups with the puppetry program. So we have very, very uh, few preliminary findings from the noon. The, the project has been very challenging because of the distance, because of the pandemic. Um, uh, the access to patterns has been reduced. So, so we're relying on very, very small sample. But we're finding um, already through interviews with teachers and through um, the questionnaires, that there's a positive impact on uh, their sense of efficacy. Uh, they feel more confident in dealing with the classroom, they feel more confident responding to teachers. And that is especially visible for teachers who are newly qualified or who are probation teachers who may not have the same level of experience in how to deal with challenging situations in the classroom or in, a, in an earlier setting. Um, we're also finding um, through teachers' report um, that there might be positive uh, impact on children's empathy. Uh, you know, teachers do say that they, they recognize that children are able to respond to other child who's crying more um, empathically, that they, they show more kindness. Um, they, you know, they, they sort of stand by if there's an argument by the victim. So, so they develop this both empathetic or maybe to some degree the, the cognitive capacity to understand emotions of others as well. Um, when we ran um, kind of more quantitative analysis data, and again, we only have a few data points because we, we, we completed those questionnaires pre and post intervention, um, and with access to the parent being limited, we only have a few data points, um, we're finding that there might be a modest impact on affective empathy. So on this figure, um, you will see um, three colors, and each color um, represents different 
uh, type of empathy. So dark blue is um, the affective empathy, the purple is the cognitive empathy, and the light blue is a total. And positive, um, positive signs above zero indicate that there's a positive difference. So when we measure empathy pre and post interventions, there's an increase and negative figures indicate that um, there's, there's, there's a negative difference in a way that there's a um, deterioration almost we can, can imagine in an empathy. Um, and like I say, this is um, a very small sample with just five children and children um, have been selected also uh, because they, they might have some uh, behavioral difficulties. They might have you know, challenging emotional needs. So I'll be very cautious in interpreting this quantitative data. Uh, but we can see, you know, in, in a few cases, in the majority of the cases, there's this modest um, positive impact on affected empathy in particular. So this ability to resonate with emotions of others um, and respond uh, more positively to emotions of others. Um, and what are the next steps for us? Well, we, we are conducting the evaluation in Delmarna cluster. Um, we'll be collecting data on emotion recognition and face perception in June. Um, and we'll be, again, collecting more, more data on the empathy and emotion regulation questionnaires as well. Um, we um, are collecting, we've just received the final evaluations from uh, Delmarna from early um, early years in P1 from Delmarna will be completing analysis on those to have more large scale, more kind of quantitative data on them, especially on the impact on, um, on empathy or the emotions and behaviors as well. Um, and our plans for the future through additional funding is to create a bank of resources um, that could be available to teachers, practitioners, to parents um, that could be sort of ready uh, activities um, and that parents could pick up, just could pick up with, you know, commercial need packets and, and, and maybe apply some of the learnings from the project in, in, in their everyday practice. So I guess questions I have for you as well as, um, you know, where can we measure this um, wider impact? We're focusing at the moment on uh, nurseries and primary schools. We're hoping to enroll it with um, social care workers and kind of anyone else who works with teachers. Um, and I wonder, you know, from your perspective, um, uh, which target groups, which groups we, should, we could target, you know, for who this project may be of value. So who would be the beneficiaries of that as well? Um, and how can we continue and, and really um, ensure that there's a sustainability of the program? Um, whether the ready-made resources or the toolkits is one way to go, or, or whether a series of workshops or, you know, professional development opportunities is, is the way to go. So, so I have a few questions for you as well, and, and, and we welcome your insights. Um, but that is the introduction to the program, and um, and I hope you found it uh, interesting and enjoyable, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion and hearing more. Okay. Thank you. Stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Joanna. That was really lovely to, to hear your presentation, and I've got lots of thoughts and questions. I'm sure that the audience do as well. I'm going to move on fairly swiftly, um, and then we'll bring both of your, your kind of responses together in the panel discussion afterwards and introduce Tanya uh, now, who is our final speaker. Tanya Chajka is a French native author, teaching artist and founder of, of Le Petit Monde Theatre. Living in Edinburgh since 1991, she qualified as an earliest practitioner in 1999. Keen to share her native language with children, she developed her own bilingual English French writing featured in her shows and picture books. Besides holding an earliest practitioner part-time post, Tanya is currently focusing on developing resources to support the teaching of French language through play, creative puppetry, and bilingual stories that are accessible to non-French speakers. So welcome along, Tanya. Um, hello, um, I'm just about to share. Um, and is that, is that okay? Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for having me in this event. I'm really, really excited. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, so, yes. Um, um, so, yeah, um, I set up Le Petit Monde in 2008 um, because I wanted to introduce children to my French language and culture through bilingual uh, puppet shows and play. 
Um, so each show has um, or had a different story featuring Lapin and his French garden friends and myself. Um, so um, I'm going to talk to you a bit more about creative puppetry for language learning in the early years. And if I click, yeah. So yeah, on the left side, you see me in action in, the, in one of my shows, The Wonderful World of Lapin. And I also did workshops um, um, to introduce French um, to children who, who possibly didn't have any knowledge of French. So it's all accessible um, to uh, all the children. In 2017, I wrote a picture book featuring Lapin and, and the other characters of the shows, which my brother uh, Olivier illustrated. And that's it here, it's called Lapin is Hungry. Um, thanks to a successful crowdfunding uh, campaign, we got 500 copies uh, of Lapin is Hungry printed. My aim was to test how the children and their grown-ups would uh, engage with the book. And I wanted to find out if there was an appetite for my particular bilingual writing which is again accessible. There's no translation, the, the English and French flow together. Um, so although my work uh, has taken different forms, the desire to share my language through a creative, accessible and play-based approach has always been at the core of all my activities, um, including the book. So in 2018, I enrolled in a master's studies at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Um, I love the course, um, totally, totally in love with everything I did. Um, best move I've ever done, uh, moving in a more academic direction. Um, so yeah, um, the course helped me redefine um, how I wanted to work and what I could bring to the education sector with my skills, my experience. Um, discovering creative puppetry played a big part in this journey. So. Um, what is creative puppetry? So for teacher and lecturer Smith, um, creative puppetry is when children and practitioners design, make and manipulate puppets together. So it's very simple, but it's not always put in practice. Um, one form of creative puppetry is puppetizing where adults apply creative dramatic techniques um, to direct children in the use of puppets for acting out stories or songs, rhymes, and so on. There's also um, the performing is for one another uh, without any audience or stage. So it's really a play, a play activity. Um, it can be argued that creative puppetry um, fits Vygotsky's theory where the more knowledgeable other uh, in this case, the teacher who knows um, some puppet techniques um, is able to guide the children in exploring their own skills. Um, and through designing and making, it's also, um, I feel it also fits the active learning approach. Um, that's very popular. Um, and Dewey's views of the teacher as a facilitator and guide, giving students the opportunities to develop as active and independent learners. Um, through play, creative puppetry can be part of a football approach. Um, and uh, since it promotes that all aspects of learning are linked through first hand experiences and play. Um, it also links to the freedom with guidance that Katrina mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, so that's creative puppetry a little bit um, in, in education um, theory. Um, described by Smith as one of the easiest and ways to use puppets, able to activate any material and engage all learning styles, ages and abilities, Creative puppetry seems an accessible and inclusive teaching method or tool. It can be also um, an excellent, rich, active, socio-constructivist, uh, child-led and play-based educational tool. However, despite Smith 
uh, observing that um, puppets are fantastic for exploring language learning. She told me in um, um, the communication we had when I was doing my master's on email. Literature about creative puppetry in association with language learning appears sparse. I couldn't find um, any. Since I had been exploring puppetry and creativity as language teaching tools for many years, I had written a bilingual picture book myself um, that was accessible and I was an EYP. Um, I felt in a good place to conduct some research. So I did through my master's, I did two case studies. Um, the first one was uh, very, very small. Um, it was called, what are the benefits to children aged three to five of making their own puppets and using them in storytelling in relation to developing engagement with French language in a frugal oriented nursery. So it was conducted um, in the nursery where I was working and involved three girls uh, aged around four. The intervention took place over four sessions during which the children were introduced to the book, uh, La Pan is Hungry. Um, then we met puppets of the characters together and rehearsed the story. Finally, the children were observed playing with the puppets and props and I brought um, on their own. The data was gathered through pre and post intervention games, very simple games, and I also uh, video recorded uh, some of the sessions for observations. So I'll briefly go over the, the, the findings. Um, so the participants mainly engaged with French language for repeating my words. They also spoke and made up their own words, which was fun to hear. Um, the French characters' names were all used in correct context each time, but the link um, lapin meaning rabbit was not made. So every character, there are four animals, they, all, they are all called rabbit, uh, snail, bird, and worm in French. Um, they, the, chil the children showed a, sh showed a strong engagement uh, with the story, its characters, and the reenacting through the puppets. But it appears that this was not a direct response to the French words. It just loved to play. Um, the use of French language decreased noticeably when I was quiet and stopped playing with them. So these findings suggest that interaction with the French speaker is key to keep the children motivated in using the, the other language. So that's where um, the MKO comes into. Um, this playful and child-led environment acted as a vehicle for the participants to safely and confidently explore and enjoy the new words uh, they were learning. Um, so yeah, so it was fun. In for my second case study, um, larger scale, I decided to 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 go further. Uh, it was called Exploration of a Play and Creative Puppetry Based Approach to Teach Modern Languages at Early Years Primary Level. So this was my final year project in my master's. Um, um, I followed the same approach of introducing Lapin is Hungry, making puppets and reenacting the story through play. But this time, three teachers participated and delivered the sessions. I was um, on hand remotely via Teams. The aim of the study was to pilot the creative puppetry practice and analyze what differences, if any, it would make to, to the teachers in their teaching uh, modern languages practice at P1 and P2 levels. Um, we followed the community of practice um, research model called Lesson Study by Dudley, which I'm a huge fan of now. Um, so following that model, the teachers delivered four lessons in each P1 and P2 classes over four weeks. We jointly planned and reflect on each lesson uh, before the next one was delivered. In addition to the first study, a multimodal approach was used to introduce the story at the start of each session. So the first one was the printed copy and second session, they listened to the audio version um, they also had the, the, the PDF on the whiteboard. Um, in the third, they had video uh, of myself telling the story. And then in the fourth one, they went back to the printed copy. 
I also made other resources available to the teachers um, to support the activities. So, um, yeah. So, um, although the, the focus was on the teacher's learning, we found that um, the project had an impact on the children's learning as well. Um, regarding learning French, the teachers uh, reported um, that the children were highly and emotionally engaged throughout the four lessons. Um, they acknowledged a strong ownership of learning through pupils making and manipulating their own puppets. Most children enjoy performing the bilingual story and remember the French words really well. So there was a development of the working memory skills there that they acknowledged. Um, teachers also um, noticed and were very, very surprised to see that most children spontaneously wrote French words um, from the book beside their drawings because in the in the first session they would listen they they would be introduced to the story and then draw a picture um, of their favorite character or whatever they wanted in the book and that's when they they decided to write words um, they also made connections to their prior learning linking uh, French and English vocabulary and recalling words or sounds that they had heard the teachers felt that the bilingual storybook written using a flowing um, continuity between English and French supported the literacy across languages approach that they are developing in schools, in the, in the school, sorry. So that was, that was important to them. Um, developing social skills was part of the project as well. Um, so the the impact was less than the other ones, but it was still important. Um, the children um, supported each other in making the puppets, in speaking French um, and performing as well. There was a, a strong social bond between the pupils. Um, teachers reported that um, some P1 children spontaneously set up chairs with snacks um, and teddies, so pretend snacks, loose parts, uh, to watch their peers practice um, their show. Others clap their friends um, after the performances. So it sounded like it was fun. Um, here's a picture. Um, I didn't want to go on. I've got quite a few, but I didn't want to show too many. Um, but yeah, here's a picture where you will see some of the writing in French, broccoli, escargot, uh, carrot. Um, overall, the teachers felt very, very proud of all the pupils for their strong engagement and for how much they had achieved in such a short time. Um, regarding the impact um, on the teachers' learning, um, this was an opportunity for them to observe their pupils actively learning and uh, also an opportunity to explore new tools. It, everything was completely new to the teachers and the learners. Um, this allowed the teachers to reflect on what works and what parts of their practice could be improved. Um, so we openly discuss things in, in our discussions. And they said they felt inspired. Um, and felt more confident in using stories. Um, and that, yeah, and they were going to expand on providing play opportunities for French language learning. They did feel that puppet making was lengthy um, and some pupils needed support, uh, which was expected, um, but they valued its benefits as a learning tool and agreed such approach could complement their current practice. The study, I must say, also revealed a lack of accessible resources to teach uh, modern languages through play and creativity. This was the teacher's views, that they needed more um, resources um, like, like the book and creative puppetry. <laughs> so um, moving on. Oh, yes. So that's, yes, that's. Um, to give you an idea of the type of puppets that the children made. Um, they had tubes that they covered with felt and then simple card eyes and, and, and noses and things. 
so it was an effort between the teachers and the children. I must say that it's, it's, they were all making the puppets together. So following those um, quite unexpected results for myself, um, I, con I contacted SILT, um, Scotland's National Centre for Languages, in the hope that they would support me in developing uh, this approach further. I'm glad to say that I accepted. And this is going to be the final part of my presentation. So this is called the Early Years Creative Puppetry Project that I'm currently working on with SILT. Um, so it's a professional learning partnership, um, which involves myself, SILT, and 20 settings across Scotland, a mix of schools and nurseries. Um, because it was already tried and tested, we're following the same approach um, to the delivery of the activities um, as in case study two. So four sessions, two teachers per class, I forgot to say in the lesson study, one delivers and one observes, and, and also planning and reflecting discussions um, for each, each um, activity. Um, pre and post intervention individual questionnaires are sent out to to the teachers instead of interviews. I was doing interviews for the masters. The aim is for teachers to safely explore the creative puppetry approach to teach a modern language and possibly embed it in their practice. Um, for this presentation, I will focus on the findings that, um, that are um, around the children's engagement with the activities and their self-confidence in using French words. Um, I'm still going through um, the findings, the results. So uh, it's a work in progress. Um, all findings are based on um, the teachers and the early years practitioners comments and observations. Um, a total of 364 children took part in the first group. Um, so we had group one with 10 settings and we're currently going uh, doing the, the activities with group two. Um, so in this group one, there were 364 children. So um, cohort one findings, again, uh, across the 10 settings and three at the project, all participants, uh, teachers, EYPs recorded the children were excited, focused on the activities and listened well to the story each time. Um, it, this response equals the pupils and the children's uh, responses in both case studies of my masters. Um, it appears that the book seen by the educators as engaging and accessible but still challenging, linked to a play-based, active and creative and multimodal approach to learning French, helped maintaining this strong engagement throughout. That's, that's how the teachers um, sum it up. In turn, this led to children displaying a high level of self-confidence in using the French words from the story. Some shared their new words with staff, either greeting them the next morning or answering um, to, to the teachers in French, especially no merci, that's quite a popular one, and even uh, teaching the, the adults some words. And they've been sharing their new words with their peers as well through play. Um, most of them were also keen to repeat words. So um, teachers also observe that children who have um, um, English as an additional uh, language um, enjoy taking part. Um, and sometimes they, in, in, in different activities, they, would, they wouldn't um, maybe take part so that there was a surprise there from, from some of the teachers. Also, children would usually find difficult to focus or engage in activities. So some children with um, additional support needs. Um, across, it, it, was, it was obvious that across the, the settings, this was uh, a strong, a strong uh, surprise for the teachers. So those, those children showed interest. They either drew pictures, very detailed pictures. That's something that some children wouldn't usually do or listen attentively. Again, some children um, 
would, wouldn't usually uh, listen uh, so attentively for such a long time, but they did. Um, and some wrote French words as well. Um, so this is very brief, obviously, um, but hopefully it gives you an idea. So I've just made a wee summary um, to say that um, creative puppetry linked to um, a bilingual story that's engaging, accessible, but still challenging. Um, yeah, added to the creative puppetry based on play, active learning, and a multimodal approach to, to the storytelling can lead to strong engagement in the activities, ownership of learning from most children, including children with additional support needs. And it can lead to a high level of self-confidence in using French words. Um, displayed in various contexts. Um, teachers, I must say, I, I like that teachers also reported that um, the children uh, appeared very proud of their achievements. Um, and there is much more to, to, to go through, but um, long term, this practice um, um, could act as a platform for children to tell their own stories or use not just French and the language they're learning or their own languages, there's, it, it can go, it can go a bit further, I would think. So yeah, I'm looking forward to continue um, exploring a creative puppetry and developing um, a practice uh, that can support modern languages. Um, yeah, so I think that's me, um, my references and yeah. Feel free to get in touch. Um, I'm happy to hear from people. Um, yeah, I'm on Twitter and the hashtag for the SEAL project is, is there on the, on the page as well, if you want to follow us on Twitter. Um, so, merci. Merci. Thank I'm you so hearing. much, Tanya. Um, and I won't pretend that we're going to finish at six o'clock. This event is recorded, so if people need to leave, that's absolutely fine at six o'clock. If you two are okay, we'll just run till, till five past, just so we can get a couple of questions in. Um, yes. And as I've said, if it's recorded, it is recorded, so people can leave at six if they want to. Um, firstly, lovely to, to listen to both of your presentations. I think there's some clear synthesis between, between your approaches. Um, it, was, it was really, really interesting to listen to them. For me, what I found really interesting was that as much as there are outcomes for children, um, Joanna, you noted that that the staff themselves really found an improvement and, and developed their own confidence. Um, and that's probably something that you can also speak to, Tanya. So, John, I'll ask you first, how important is it that the teachers come on board and have that level of engagement with puppetry? Well, I, I think it's crucial for, I think, for any intervention, the, the engagement from all stakeholders is absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we really try to work closely with teachers, understanding their needs, you know, develop the programme to, to the needs of their class. Um, there's flexibility in you know uh, what we deliver. Um, um, th there's a question about uh, you know formative and, um, evaluations, and I mean this is very much um, work in progress. Very much you know work close with uh, teachers, tweak it based on their feedback, based on feedback from children as well. Um, so so we do involve all the stakeholders in the development of the intervention as well. And I think that's the only way to make it work. You need to understand the needs of your of, of the group you're working with um, in order to you know to to um, deliver something um, that you know will be will be you know they'll be engaged with and, and ultimately you know we do need to know the research behind it so, so we know we have a suspicion of what might work and why it might work uh, but it needs to be deliverable it needs to be um you know approachable and 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 really context specific as well context sensitive so i think it's crucial to involve them from the beginning absolutely and tanya a similar question for you really did you have any challenges with staff engagement when you were scaling up the project um no, actually, they were they were all very keen. They, they it went through sealed. So sealed approaches. Um, we made a video to explain what would project be about, and then they sign up if they want to take part, and they were very very excited. We we had uh, over I don't know over a hundred um, people who wanted to take part, uh, and at the beginning we wanted 10, 10 settings. So we we decided to go 10 and then another 10. Um, so no, it seems that there is a demand for, for modern languages. Um, 
play-based resources. And I think, yeah, I think it, it did show that the amount of interest we got um, was amazing. I think 132 we got, um, wow. so yeah. Yeah, that's really positive to hear. As you, as you yeah. say, it demonstrates a real appetite to engage in, in puppetry, given what we know about the research and the values that that can bring for young children. Joanna, there is a question from Arnie and Wendy Dunlop in the chat. Um, I don't know if you've had time to read it and prepare an answer because it's, it's relatively dense. <laughs> yes, um, so, uh, I might be able to answer it yeah. only partially. I'll let um, you go ahead and answer that then. Yes. Um, uh, okay, so is that the question? Sorry, there's the one around. So uh, it'd be really interesting to know about the impact of the programme on transition. I'm oh, right, yeah. Okay, we'll that, so the second impact. one, so I can come on further down as well. Okay, yeah, the transition. Yes, so this is something we are very interested in. Um, and this is what we we're hoping to capture. This is why also um, the, the Del Marnock cluster, uh, I think it's the first one when we do sort of a, a kind of more dense evaluation. So we've engaged consciously, we've engaged P1 classes, but also the nursery attached to the primary school. Um, and then we know that the majority of the children in nursery will start primary school um, in August. So we're hoping to come back in August um, and, and look at the children who have had chance to engage with the program um, this year, how they adapt, you know, to 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 the first, you know, first year and how, how they manage this transition as well. Um, and again, the P1 teachers have had the puppetry training, so so they'll have the materials, they'll have the, so they have the puppets for the lifetime, um, and they'll be able to, you know, potentially use some of the activities and some of the learnings from this cohort to again support children to this transition. Um, we have, um, I don't know if uh, Bailey or Beth are here, but um, when we were working in the noon, um, because we had to adapt the, the program to um, sort of the pandemic realities, and you know there was a time when there was you know sc schools were open, closed, open, closed. Um, we had a specific theme and a specific session on uh, dealing with transition and dealing with change as well. So one of the one of the themes is really you know how how do we kind of support children, especially when they had to kind of go back home, school, home, school, home, school, closure, you know, um, and deal with this change and, you know, kind of managing anxiety around transitions. Um, so that's something that we are very interested in and hoping that we can capture it um, in the Marnock cluster. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, watch this space. Uh, hopefully mm. there'll be more coming. Thank you for that, Joanna. Uh, don't see more questions in the cat chat, just, just comments saying thank you for some really good presentations. And as I say that again, Elizabeth comes through with a question first. Um, it'll be interesting to know if the nursery and P1 staff are working together so that they take the puppet and stories that the children know into P1 with them rather than meeting a new puppet there. I suspect that's a question for Joanna but I'll, I'll let you answer that and I'll let Tanya come in afterwards. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, um, I mean, we know that they, they, they work quite closely together, that when we do the training sessions, we combined nursery staff and, um, and school staff. So, um, and you know, the, 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 often the settings are, um, you know, the, the, they're in the same building even, so they'll be working quite closely. Um, the idea is that um, the six weeks that um, are structured, there's still a level of flexibility. So, so we don't impose uh, on anybody that you have to exactly do every single activity that's in the package. Um, there's some you know, example scripts, example activities, stories, um, but we know already that teachers adapt them to, you know, if it's Christmas, they'll kind of create some narrative around Christmas, for example, um, but we're hoping that they can reuse some of them um, or at least they, they have more skills or tools um, on how to how to use puppets to you know to kind of create um, the sort of safe space to tackle any topic or, or tackle any or discuss any event that is currently you know maybe be happening um, in the school. Um, so um, yes, yeah, so it would be interesting to know you know whether there's a repetition or how I mean, there's a development of the story. Mm -hmm. um, but interestingly as well, I mean, each puppet is different. So um, th there was a kind of similar comment, um, uh, Tanya and yours, with this kind of co-creating 
of the, the puppet between children and teachers. And we very much encourage that. Um, you know, the puppets are bespoke, uh, they're tailor-made for each teacher. The teachers are told this is yours and yours only. Um, you can't give it, to, you can't share it with anyone else. Um, they, they belong to this classroom. They have you no know, um, specific gadgets. You no know, children can create, uh, you know, the you know additional, I don't know, uh, items of clothing. They can, you know, they also often bring items <coughs> to the puppet. They create the backstory of the puppet and they, they really guide their future as well. So it's very much a co-created um, uh, entity, which I think is beautiful. And I think Tanya, I wonder if, if you kind of find that as well, that, you know, the children get very engaged um, yes. in developing a character. Yeah. It yeah, it's a character. It becomes a part of the, the school life. This little animal is, I know it's mice. Uh, yeah, it's, and because it's their own, yeah, there's um, ownership of learning again, you know, um, and having the teacher involved in, at the same level. I, I love that as well, because that's teamwork. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, so and, although the materials may be similar, that they might be done differently in different contexts as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it, pup, that's where puppetry is as this magic um, imp, um, role for children because it's not alive, but it's nearly alive. So they accept that it's not alive, but they also want to bring life to that to that puppet. So it's in between, it's in between real life and, and a, it's even better than a toy because we can animate it and give it some life. Um, mm. And that's where it's so powerful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for yeah. that, Tanya. I think that's a really good note to end on. Mm. Um, and we talk about the value of co-creation, thinking back to Katrina's presentation right at the start, the Frobelian principles. Yes. It's been carried through to all of your presentations today. So thank you very much for joining us and presenting your uh, slides and your research for us today. We'd love to stay in touch. So um, please do send through details and we can distribute those to the mailing lists. Thank you to those of you for joining us today. Um, please feel free to stay in touch on Twitter and on our mailing list for future events. Uh, but thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evenings. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye.